video is the next instalment for William Carey and we're up to the voyage and the hardships. The blue waves danced to the far off horizon. The sea breathed blue sweet and keen and as William Carey stood on deck it cooled his cheeks. It was so sweet that he even removed his ugly uncomfortable wig that he might miss nothing of it. Carey looked at the wig. Such a clumsy thing and if it looked horrible off what must it look like on? With a hasty glance round to make sure that there was no one to see, Carrie flung the thing overboard into the blue water and rejoiced to feel the wind ruffling the scanty, close-cropped hair which had begun to grow again, at least round the back of his head. The voyage was pleasant now. Dorothy had got over her seasickness and her homesickness and the children were thriving. Catherine was her usual helpful self. William had recovered from the fever which had troubled him not long after they sailed and he and John Thomas were working away at the Bengali language. At other times he had submerged himself in one or other of the 77 parts of the botanical magazine or the 31 parts of English botany. So the little missionary company were contented and now William had got rid of his wig. One problem however was always in their minds. What were they going to do when they reached India? Who would give them advice? What would they do if they refused permission to land? But when God sends people to a place, he sees that they stay there if they are willing to obey him. And the fact is that neither Carey nor his wife ever left India once they got there, until they left it for heaven. The Kron Princess Maria sailed boldly up the estuary of the river Huguli, and when she reached Calcutta there was no one on board to whom the East India Company could raise the least objection. You see, the objectionable people, the missionaries had been quietly transferred at the estuary to a small native boat, which took them up river. How eagerly the little party scanned the banks of the new land, and how they stared at the villages they passed, and how the people stared at them. As they journeyed, the tide turned against them, and the Indian boatmen put in at a landing place near a small village, until they could go on again. And with eager delight, Carey sprang ashore. At last he was on Indian soil, in an Indian village. He did not know enough Bengali to preach to the people, much as he would have loved it, but Thomas did, and they listened to him for three solid hours. To the delight of the children, one of the Indians brought food for them, and they all sat on the ground and ate rice and curry from plantain leaves, using those fingers which were made before forks. It is hope, to be hoped that the curry did not prove too hot for the tender mouths of the very young. With the turn of the tide, they were off again, and the next day they landed quietly in Calcutta and nobody even noticed them. First of all, Thomas had to find his wife and daughter. Then he had to find and rent a house where the two families could live. He met someone else in Calcutta too, a man he had led to the Lord Jesus Christ during his last day in India, named Ram Ram Bashu. This man had not been faithful to the Lord, but as he seemed truly sorry, the missionaries agreed that he ought to be given another chance and he was taken on as Carey's language teacher. Thomas unhappily was entrusted with their funds, and the way that man made the money disappear had to be seen to be believed. Worst of all, Carey now found that Thomas had left India in debt, and his creditors were on his track. And very soon the money he had set out with was all gone. There was a good deal of travelling about in search of work for Carey, but in the end they had to agree to separate. Thomas to set up in Calcutta as a doctor, and Carey to find some means of keeping himself and his family. There they were, stranded in a strange city, in a foreign land, destitute. Dorothy was worn out with the unsettled life, and she was frankly nervy and cross. Catherine, too, was complaining, and the children none too well. The curry and rice did not suit any of them, and they longed for an honest loaf instead of the stodgy round Indian chapatis. Then Dorothy and the two older boys fell sick with dysentery, and Felix was soon very dangerously ill. But the Lord was taking care of them all, and the day came when they were ready to feel, fulfill Carey's dream of going up into the country, building a simple hut and living like the natives, that they might win the natives for Christ. Carey had been offered a piece of land at a place called Dahata, some three days' journey upriver from Calcutta, and after many difficulties Thomas managed to obtain enough money to make it possible for them to set off. So one Monday morning in February, a boat was loaded up with their baggage and the few pieces of furniture Carrie possessed. Catherine stepped gingerly in. Dorothy and Felix, still ill, were helped in. The baby and little William were handed in. The men folk got in and the Indian oarsmen began to row. That was a journey of thrills and terrors and of real hardship. 
It was hot and their way lay through narrow salty waterways and across a wide salt lake. Yet there was a world of loveliness in the rich tropical plants and trees and especially in the palm trees which fringed the river and it all delighted Carrie's nature loving soul. As they passed one village, Carrie gave a shout, Stop! For there under a rough shed stood a huge aisle, hung idol, hung with garlands of flowers, strangely clad priests, and a number of musicians made various unpleasant noises with flutes and tom-toms. And all the while villagers came with their offerings, baskets of brilliantly coloured coloured fruit, and bowls of rice to gain the favour of the hideous man-made thing they worshipped. How Carrie longed to speak to them as they halted, watching, but for the time being, as far as they were concerned, he was as good as dumb. Then they came to a terrifying region, the tiger-haunted swamps called the Thunderbuns. Here rivers and creeks crossed and recrossed hundreds of square miles of thick jungle, almost uninhabited by man, but very much inhabited by tigers, leopards, rhinoceroses, buffaloes, monkeys which chattered in the trees, and pythons and cobras, which made their stealthy way through the undergrowth, and on the mud banks by the river the crocodiles lay, malignant, basking in the hot sunshine. Dorothy and Catherine were openly terrified, and the children reflected it in their panic. When the little boat was obliged to tie up on the bank, no one, not even Ram Ram Boshu or the Indian boatman, dared to go more than a hundred yards away from the boat. The nights were disturbed by the jungle noises, by the croaking frogs, the chorus of crickets, and by the humming of swimming mosquitoes, who soon added to the little party's discomforts by the irritating attentions. But the Heavenly Father had them in his care, and not the least of his miracles was that William Carey, who had had to leave his land over because he was so sensitive to the sunlight, had not a trace of his old skin trouble, then or ever after. At last the journey ended, and the boat drew in to the little landing stage near the flat roof bungalow with a semicircular van- veranda, which was to be their home, if it was not already occupied. But it was occupied. The screened windows were open to the morning air, and a few Indians idling around the place made it all too plain that someone else was in possession of the home they had hoped for. For a while there was consternation in the little boat. There were feeble reproaches from Dorothy and vigorous protests from Catherine, while the children listened to their elders with wide-opened eyes and trembling lips. What were they to do now, Catherine demanded. Dorothy felt too ill for anything but a sullen silence after a first querulous outburst. They could hardly camp out in this tiger-infested region, Catherine went on and on. But it was all right. Uh, all the fuss was for nothing. It would have been better to trust God first and ask questions afterwards. Living in the bungalow at that time was Mr. Charles Short, and he was out shooting with his dog that morning. Great was his surprise when he saw the pitiful little company of sick and weary Europeans stumbling out of the boat. He hurried down to them, and with eager hospitality he welcomed them into his home, and oh, the bliss of a real home again, after that awful journey. It was so delightful to be waited on and cared for. In a matter of hours, invalids were beginning to improve, and Catherine was happily settled with the little ones, and Carrie and Mr. Short began to talk. Mr. Short did not think much of their missionary hopes. Absurdity complaint, he exclaimed. The Indian people would never listen, and if they would, they're not worth going after. And he did not disguise the fact that he had a pretty poor opinion of religion in general anyway. But that did not prevent him from proving the kindest of friends. Carey told him of his plan to build a house and of his disappointed hope that they might have found the bungalow empty. Well, it's not empty, Mr. Short said roundly, but you're going to stay here with me, the whole lot of you, until you've got somewhere ready. Stay half a year if you like. I shall be only too pleased to have you, and there's plenty of room. But they did not stay there for long, after all, for soon exciting news came from Thomas in Calcutta. He had met an old friend, Mr. Udney, a Christian who owned two indigo factories, and he had asked Thomas to go as overseer to one of them. Thomas promptly accepted, and as promptly suggested, Kerry as a good man to manage the other one. Kerry was in no doubt. The family were fit, as they had not been for months, and to the delight of them all, Catherine and Mr. Short had fallen in love and were to be married. It meant yet another apprenticeship, it was true, for he knew nothing about the manufacture of indigo, but it would provide him with an assured salary and leave him plenty of time for language study and under his care would be numerous workmen, all needing a saviour, of whom Carey could tell them. And that ends bad instrument for William Carey.